We are glad you guys are here this morning. And uh, how many of you were here last Sunday in part one of Mind Your Own Business? And how many of you, good, and, and appreciate Pastor Matt jumping in there for me. And how many of you started your homework of making a list of all of where you spend your money for 30 days, making a list of your debts, making a list of your bills? Good, 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 because we're going to get smarter. We're going to work harder, and, and we're going to become good stewards because God's business is our business, and our business, our finances, is his business, and we are simply managers and stewards over what he has given to us. And so, uh, <clears throat> Get out your Bibles. Well, I have a problem. You know, the, the snowstorm and all, you know, I, I, we, I, I had to get, when we moved to Black Forest, I had to get a four-wheeler with a snowplow. I had to have it. it just it was a long driveway. And so I spent a lot of time on the four-wheeler just kind of playing, and, and I didn't prepare anything for this Sunday. <laughs> So Pastor Brad, where'd Pastor Brad go? He's got to sing. We need to do about four or five more songs should fill the next 30 minutes or so. What would you think if that's what literally happened? That if I came in here and said, I'm, I'm unprepared, I didn't pray, I didn't study, I didn't look into God's word, I just playing on the four-wheeler in the snow. You'd be like, well, you're wasting you're being wasteful. You're wasting my time and, and you're being wasteful and, and, and you didn't spend your time wisely this last week. And a lot of times that's the way God feels about us and our finances. Because he says, well, what'd you do with what I gave you? We're like, I don't, I don't know. She did it. He did it. <laughs> and, and, and we get distracted and we're not living the way we should. And here's the way Jesus told us to prepare he said in Luke chapter 14, he said, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Well, here's my heart as a pastor. I don't want people to laugh at you about your finances. I want people to be in awe of you. They're like, dang, dang, dude, that, 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 that couple, that guy, man, that family, they got their stuff together, man. Like, they, they, they don't have any bills. Like, they, they pay it. They don't have any debt. Like, they don't have any credit. They might use a credit card, but they, they don't have any debt. They pay it off. Have you ever heard of anyone like that? They, their cars are paid for. And woe to those, and I'm sure there's some in this crowd that, that you literally have paid off your house and you don't have a house payment. And all you have to do is, is to pay your utilities? Whoa, what a burden, <laughs> right? Well, God wants us to manage his, his finances as well. And so we learned last week that all that we have belongs to God, that everything that we've received from is his, and we are simply managers and stewards, and we need to, we're going to be held accountable for how we spend and, and use his finances. Now, here's the reality in our culture and our society today. 78% of the people in this room live paycheck to paycheck, national average. That if the snowstorm had continued, had shut down, and people couldn't get to their computers to hit send to put that money in your account or print to print your check, or you couldn't get your check, and, and you didn't get this week's paycheck or this, this you know, month's paycheck, you would be in jeopardy, and you, you, you wouldn't know what to do. Statistics say that the average national household income is $61,372, and the average household debt, not counting mortgage, okay? I personally view mortgage as good debt because a home or property or land goes up in value. So I'm paying it off, but it's increasing value. If I, if I get a loan on a car, I am continuing to pay upward, and it's continuing to decline in value. $38,000 household debt, average household debt in the U.S., and the average uh, family or household has in credit card, $9,333 of that $38,000 is rollover credit card. Thanks, Pastor, for that encouraging news. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. But I realize that a lot of you are in this category and I don't want you to be and I want to help you get out of debt and I want to help you live in freedom and the victory that God has for you. And I want you to live in the freedom that you can give when God says to give because if the Holy Spirit, an angel woke you up in the night last night and said, give $500 to an organization, a person, over half of the people in the room don't have the $500 extra in an account that they could freely give away. They would be taking it from their rent or taking it from a payment. They don't have that in excess and couldn't give it away. I believe you're a generous people and I believe you have generous hearts and all the only thing we need to fix is to get your finances figured out so that you can even be, you, your, your giving and your, your generosity can match what's in your heart. And you can, you can sow and freely give and freely invest. So today we're going to talk about part two is show me the money. And here's what I'm going to say. When you show me the budget, I'll show you the money. Show me the money. Show me where your budget, show me where your money is going. They say that one third of Americans live by a budget. That means two thirds don't. And so we have two too many people that end up with too much month left at the end of their money. USA article just yesterday said that Americans consider $19,800 a life-changing amount of money. Now here's the amazing thing. If we say the average, average household income is 61,000 in the United States, added 20,000 to it, here's what happens to the $61,000 a year income household. If, if we just had $81,000, Life would be so good. But here's what's crazy. A family that makes $81,000 is sitting on $81,000 going, we just don't have enough. If we had $101,000, now life would be good. And people that make $101,000, if they had $20,000 more, if you're not happy where you are, you're never going to be happy where you're going. And if you can't manage the money that God has given you, if you can't be a good steward over what you have, you can't expect that there's going to be more. Amen. You guys are amening a little bit more than the first service. <laughs> That's good. And so what, what typically happens when we, get a, when we get a bonus or we get a raise? Do we say, oh boy, I'm putting this in my retirement fund Oh boy, I'm going to give more. Oh boy, I'm going to save more. Oh boy, we're going to pay off debt. No, we're like, let's go out to eat. Come on. Let, we can afford more monthly payment on a car. Let's trade this car in. Let's take that extra $150 a month. New car. And we get a raise. And two months later, we're in the same little hole that we were before we got the raise and Luke chapter 16 is is a parable of the shrewd manager I'm going to read just the first part of it and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation it says there was Jesus shares the story with his disciples he said there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs and one day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money so the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you, my man, are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. I know I have how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So we invited each person who owed money to his employer, to his boss, to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. That is like a tanker truck of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. Here the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. 
And it is true, Jesus said, it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. What did Jesus say? Sinners handle their money better than most believers. Ow. We're called to be the city on the hill. We're called to be the light on the lampstand. We're called to be the leaders of our community, not the borrowers and the followers. We're to set an example of generosity. We're to set an example of being a good steward and good manager. Now let's go on in verse 9. I want, to, I want you to see it as well. Jesus goes on. He said, now here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. What did Jesus challenge us? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt. That we're, we're supposed to be a generous people. We're supposed to benefit others. We're supposed to make friends by using our worldly resources to sow and invest and help them. And what did Jesus say? You might feel like a lot's going out here, but in your eternal reward, in your eternal home, you are saving up truckloads of blessings. And here's my deal. I would rather, I would rather be a zillionaire for eternity than a millionaire for a few years here on earth. I would rather be a generous person and sow and invest and store up treasures in heaven. But then here's, here's the power verses, verse 10. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are tr untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, what belongs to us? Everything that we have belongs to God. It's not our stuff, it's his stuff. Why should you be entrusted with things of your own? No one, verse 13, can serve two masters. For you will love, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. So what can we learn? What can we grasp about us in 2019 and our personal finances and our business that God has given us of the finances and resources he has given to us? How do we make change? Remember, making change is, is sometimes it's a nickel, it's a dime, it's a quarter. It's not monumental moves. It's the small things that make the big difference. And so point number one, how do we make change? We must choose our master. Now, I know we all go, yes, Jesus is Lord, God is my master. But by the fruit of our lives, by the product of our personal finances, who is our master? Are we enslaved to the debtor? Are we held in bondage because we can't serve too? In Proverbs 22, 7, it says, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. As long as we owe money to Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express, as long as we owe money to those people, we're indebted to them and they have a rule and control over us. To the point that we don't pay the medical bills, we don't pay the school loans, we, we, we ignore our debts, they will come after us and they will garnish wages to get their money back and they'll really control you. They will come and take possessions and then, and then you're really in hot water. So we must choose our master by our actions as well as just our words. And so here's the reality of freedom is to have no debt. Your monthly bills, you know, are covered. It's not a hope and a prayer and a wish that maybe, maybe, maybe we'll have enough this month. You have established a budget that you live by, that you have extra at the end of each month. And at the end of each month, you have the joy of going 200, 500, 1,000, 1,500. We have this amount of money left over at the end of the month. What should we do with it? Would that not be a good place to be? Because when you get to that point, life gets fun. 
Because about three weeks ago, I was leaving my office and I was going to get in my car and there was a car parked next to mine and I noticed that the passenger tire on the, on the rear side, passenger rear tire was very low, just had a little bit of air in it. And so I didn't have time to go back inside, but I called Pastor Aaron and I said, hey, that car right outside of our offices, the tire's low, don't let him drive off without you know, knowing I need to go get some air. There's a gas station right across the street. And, while I'm, and, and when I'd looked at the tires, I'd looked and I'd felt the tread and they're, they're pretty smooth. The tires, tires were bad. Front tires were good. Just, just the way I am. I, I check your tires. When you go by, I'm, I'm looking at your tires. <laughs> and so I said to Aaron, I said, they really need tires. And the, I, I'd sensed the Lord speak, get them, get them a couple tires. And so I come back from lunch, and Aaron has, has called Discount Tire, and he says, for this car, this model, I've looked it up. It's, it's a young woman that's doing some work here at the office, and, and, and I've looked up the car, and, and here's how much it's going to cost to get, the, you know, to get two tires. And he's, he's giving me a breakdown, and then I went, time out. Because the Holy Spirit said to me when I came back, and he started talking, I'm like, yeah, Rock Family Church is going to get them two new tires. And we do, we give, we bless, we help people. But as he's talking to me, the Holy Spirit says to me, I didn't tell Rock to buy him buy tires. I told you to buy the tires. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I said, Pastor Aaron, I got it. I'll go get with her. I'm going to meet her at discount tire at 3 o'clock. So I go in with her make and her model and tire size. I get there before she does, and I start looking at tires. And at Discount Tire, they have the good, the better, and the best. And I'm, the front tires have really good tread. And so I said, I, I think I can get by with two tires. I think I can get by with two tires. Now, it's not that I don't want to give, but I have a flesh that's going, no. <laughs> okay? And so she gets there, and, and the guy goes out, and, and it's an all-wheel drive car, and he said, he said, the tires that she has on the front, they're about six, seven years old, and that's really aging out on the, the, the wear and tear of the tire, and, and, and all-wheel drive, you need to have the same tread pattern, we can't match that tire, and so you really need four tires. <laughs> how, much, how much is that going to cost? <laughs> and he's looking, at the, he's looking at the good ones. And, and she's just over here. She doesn't know what's going on. I'm like, how much is that going to cost? And he shows me the, you know, I'm like, here's what I'm thinking about spending. He goes, oh, okay. And he goes, but, but these are horrible in snow. <laughs> I can't do that. Here's a 20-something-year-old college student. I can't do that to her. I said, well, what, what do you got a little bit better than that? And so he gives me the, the best. And, and he says, but they're not really rated in snow. I go, well, what's good rated snow? Well, this best tire. <laughs> I'm like, and my wife has trained me well. Do you have any coupons, discounts, or promos? <laughs> and, and he says, well, well, I forget what kind of tire it was. See, this tire, uh, we've got, a, we've got 80, you know, 80 bucks off a set of four. And I go, oh, okay, how much is that? And, and then I'm, I'm still, I'm torn because I'm like, well, she'll never know if I put the good ones on. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit said this, what would you put on your daughter's car? Watch this. I said, put the best ones on. Here is the joy. I came home and I told my wife the amount of money that I had just spent. Well, to be honest, on a stranger's car. She didn't blink because it wasn't going to affect our livelihood. We had the excess in our account that we have the freedom and the liberty. And I'll tell you, it is one of my favorite things that I have done in the last three weeks. Amen? And, and you guys aren't helping because now I've lost my rewards in heaven because if you share what your right hand is doing, so now I've lost my reward, but that's okay. But I went through the same things that you would go through. But when I followed my heart, I'm telling you, there is nothing more joyous than the freedom and the liberty to give. Freely you have received, freely give. Point number two, success with less is the key to more. 
See, the Bible doesn't function like the world. The world says more is the answer. People say, if I had more money, I wouldn't have financial stress or strain. You just were going to have, you're going to still have financial stress or strain with more in the world standard. It's just going to get bigger stress and bigger strain. Okay? Watch, do the, do the thing on the people that win the, the lottery. Their life within five years is worse off than it was before the lottery. So more is not the answer. What does it say? Luke 16, 10, if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful over large ones. If you're dishonest with little things, you'll be, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the success or true riches of heaven? And so the answer is not more. We need to learn to manage what God has given us. I love Ecclesiastes 4, 6 in the Amplified. It says, one handful of rest and patience is better than two fistful of labor and chasing after the wind. Can I break that down for you? Better is one handful and children that love you than two fistful and a corner office. Better is one handful and a good marriage than two fistful and a bigger house. Better is one handful and family vacations than a newer better car or truck. Better is one handful and intimate friendships than keeping up with the Joneses. We've got to be content with where we are and be faithful. Then God can promote us and advance us. Third, we need new vision. We need new vision. See, this guy waited till a crisis. All of a sudden, he found out he's losing his job. Then he went, I could have had a V8 moment, and says, I need, what do I do now? How should I, how should I respond? And then he got new vision. Here's what I'm trying to save you, is don't wait till your company is having a layoff and you go, oh no, what do I do now, Lord? What if you already had three to six months in your emergency reserve fund, and when you get laid off, you're like, Psh, no, yeah, no problem. I can find a job in three months. Everyone else is like, they live paycheck to paycheck. They don't know what they're going to do come next Friday. You're like, got this, me and Jesus. Amen? So we got to have new vision. Check out this story. 399 years ago this year, 399 years ago, a group of visionary people traveled over 3,000 miles across the ocean to land on the northeast corner of of our, what is known, our country today. They came for a better life. They came to find religious freedom. They came to pursue God uninhibited. In the first four years, in year one, they established a town site and, and they accomplished something. In the second year, they elected government officials to oversee the town site. In the third year, the government decided they wanted to build a road five miles to the west. In year four, the people rebelled and said no and wanted to impeach the government. It is a complete waste to build a road. Why do we need to go west? Four years ago, you risked life, limb, family, and everything you had to be a visionary to cross an uncharted ocean to find a land you simply heard of and we're just going to point the boat that way and hope we hit it. Visionaries out of the wazoo, and in four years, they lost vision. Four years. Why would we want to go west five miles? Man, that's stupid. (laughs) You just crossed an ocean. But here's what happens in our culture today. Many of us, we start out with a dream. We want to get married. We want to buy a house. We want to have kids. We want to get a good job. And four years later, we're the status quo, apathetic guy with a remote or a game controller going, life's good. And we've lost our dream and we've lost our vision. So here's what we need to do. I love what the way Dave Ramsey says, if you want to live like nobody else, you have to live like nobody else. God has called us to be come out from, be separate from the world. So f- number four, here's what we're going to do. We're going to develop a unified family business plan. 
How are we going to spend our money? How are we going to create this plan that we are going to function by? 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. We need to come together in harmony and unity. Jesus said in Luke 11, any kingdom divided by civil war, by fighting within, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. Now, you have to realize God does this just to save ourselves. I, I, you're going to find it in your home. I am the spender. Yeah, live by the fly by the seat of our pants. And Kim is the... I mean, she is the planner. And, and if we were both like me, we're, we're hopeless. If we're both like her, we're going to live in a box. And we're never, you know, we're, 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 you know, life is good with this 1974, you know, conversion van. <laughs> so I balance her, but she absolutely balances me. And so we come together and we navigate and we come up with this vision and this plan. And it must be specific, it must be measurable, and it must be written. Write down your family business plan. And so how are we going to do this? Number one, we're gonna define our mission. What is the mission of our household? How much do we, how much do we really want to give? I, I, my desire, my desire is way beyond, but I would love to get to a place that I live on 50% and I am able to give 50% away. Now, beyond that, great, but I, I, I'm open to that, but that's kind of a, a goal of mine, is could I get to the place that we could really get there? And so Kim, the mathematician, she's working out if we make an extra payment here and we do this, that we can have our house paid off in the next seven years. So that means we're cutting back now, we're saying no to some things now to say yes to pay off the mortgage so that in seven years when I'm getting old and I don't want to, you know, that, that's what she told me, that when I'm getting old, <laughs> that the house will be paid for. But then my goal would be that we could give away more if we're not making that mortgage payment. And so what we need to do is number two, develop short term, oh, my mission, go, you were good, my mission is to daily live, love, give, and serve like Jesus. And if, we, if I could, I'm not even there yet. I'm still striving for this. But this is my mission, to live, love, give, and serve like Jesus. Number two, develop our short-term goals. Write them down. We want to, by January 1st, write down, you could be debt-free by January 1st, 2020. How cool would that be? You're 2020. Bum, 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 bum. You are debt free. Oh, there, I don't see any way to do it. Start now. Little change makes big differences. Start making the change now. Put together a cash flow plan. Our budget will define where our money goes. Number three, develop long term plans. Any good business will have long term plans college funds, retirement, investments. And, and, and here's the deal. Here's what Kim and I learned. I wish I had, we started about in my late 30s, and I wish we'd started in my 20s. But instead of me saying, the only money I am going to make is what I can work and I can produce, we took some of our money and we went, go. And we sent it off. And our money is out there working and it's making money. And we're not doing anything. It's out there just working. It's multiplying. It's adding up. And it's, and it's producing. So we keep sending, you go. Now you go. And we keep sending money off into retirement and investments and mutual funds because we want our money to start making money for us so that we can be even more generous. Number five, four, radically reduce expenses and clutter. Freeze all spending. Like, like cut off, I know you, some, some of you already do this and I admire you. Like if you really gotta get your finances order, cut the cable, direct TV, reduce your phone bill, renegotiate your car and home and renter's insurance, do whatever you need to do. I would tell you this, delete your Amazon account. <laughs> Is that bad boy so easy? You're just scrolling, you're like, hey, boom. They just, one, one, one cha-chink, 
and it's on my doorstep in 48 hours. <laughs> Kim's like, why'd you order that? I go, I don't know. <laughs> The average home, read this online, the average home has $3,100 of unused items sitting around their house. $3,100. How many of you have an old cell phone? Because you, you, if I break one, I mean, but how many of you bought the insurance on the cell phone? So you either got to let go of that $20 a month on insurance and keep the old phone or sell the old phone on, on eBay or, or uh, Craigslist right? So I have two things that I pulled from our house. We don't, this was in our house and we built a new house two years ago and the decorator designer lady said it didn't go, but we paid like five, six hundred dollars. These are like numbered registered prints and so forth. And, and they've been sitting in our house and I don't want the money for them. I've donated them to the rock church. And so it well, actually to the youth ministry and so that's the river walk in San Antonio, and this is someplace in Italy. Um, but if you'd like, I've got a silent auction going up here, and I'm, I'm totally for real. Um, and, and all the proceeds, you just write down your amount you'd like to give for it, and you're gonna give it to the, to the Revolution Youth Ministry for their room renovation. So you get a double dip, you get, you get this priceless artwork that hung in Pastor Dean's house. <laughs> and you get a deduction as you sow and you give to our amazing student ministry. Uh, let the bidding begin. <laughs> Go for it, ladies. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Number five, and that's only if you, we don't take credit cards. Oh, you can't do this on a credit card. You gotta have cash, okay? Number five, plan for downtimes. Learn how to save. We're going to be covering this in the next couple of weeks. Number six, tap into the power of generosity and the law of sowing and reaping. There, there, is, there is a power there, and we're going to cover more of this in the coming weeks. But I love 2 Corinthians 9, 6 in the Passion Bible. I, I, have you started reading the Passion Bible, the translation? That, wow. Here's my point. A stingy sower will reap a meager harvest, but the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving all because God loves hilarious generosity. That's what I want to live. And then big idea number five, we need to write and live by a monthly cash flow plan. I'll show you the money when you show me a budget. You're going to write and live by a cash flow plan. You're going to write out a budget. Proverbs 21.5 says, Plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. I love Zig Ziglar's statement. He says, If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. <laughs> All right? So we're going to spend every dollar on paper before, before, before the month begins. And either we manage our money or the lack of money will manage us. We manage it, we control it, or the lack of it will control us. And then I love John Maxwell's statement. He says, a budget is simply telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. <laughs> Amen? And then Dave Ramsey, those of you that have taken financial peace, he breaks down 11 categories that you need to budget and you need to figure out where your finances are going. And then we're just gonna wrap up in 60 seconds here. How do you put a budget together? On your notes, there's no blanks. Number one, schedule the meetings and pray. It's, it's gonna get heated. But I, want, I wanted more money for this and I wanted more money. And, and you're gonna schedule meeting pray. You're gonna review last quarter's spending and identify where the money went. How are we spending our money? Most people don't know. And then number three, we're gonna draft a rough budget. We're gonna determine how you want to spend your money. Draft a rough budget, and then we're going to work through the initial bumps because it's not gonna be like, you write a budget and we're done. It's all good. No, you're gonna, it's gonna go like, well, that didn't work very well. And then number five, you're gonna write, review and write a new budget every month together if you'll stand to your feet with me. Amen? Next week, we're going to be talking about act your wage. 
Act Your Way, just part three coming up next Sunday. I hope you'll be here. But let me talk to you guys before, before we, we go. Um, here is my heart as a pastor is I want to reach our community. I want to invest in people's lives. I want to see this place filled three, four, five times on a, on a weekend and both campuses. And so the way we can accomplish in reaching more is by your generosity. And first off, I thank you for those of you that sow, you invest and you give and you plant in the vision of this church. The reality is over 50% of the people that attend Rock Family Church don't give anything. And I don't say that out of condemnation or shame. Here's all I'm asking. I'm asking each one of you. I'm asking those that watch online. Would you give and sow something? You say, well, I can't do that tithe thing, that 10%. I don't care. Give cheerfully, the Bible says. I'm asking, could you give 20 months, $20 a month faithfully? Could you give $100 a month faithfully? The little things make the big difference. And so I ask you to just sow and invest as you're being fed and ministered to here and help us expand the kingdom work and kingdom purpose. Amen. Father, thanks for the privilege to give. Thanks for generosity to just rise up within us as a church. And God, I pray as we sit down and we navigate and we plan and we prepare and we review our finances, God, I pray that you'll give us creative ideas, creative insight on how we can reduce our spending and increase our, 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 our finances so that we can pay off debt, we can pay off loans, and we can become financially free, no longer bound to the lender, but bound to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we go, I want to make sure that each and every person here that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that you've surrendered your heart, your life, and you've made him the Lord, the master of your life. And if you're here and you look inside and you say, I'm not sure if I would go to heaven. I'm not sure where I stand with God. We live and breathe to lead people home to a loving God and to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all that you have to do is say, I want that. I want God's love. I need God's forgiveness. I want God to adopt me into his family. And we don't have to change. We don't have to, we don't, so many people are like, well, when I stop this, then I'm going to get right with God. When, I, when I've read my Bible a little bit more, then I'm going to come home to God. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. He loves you just the way you are. And he accepts you and receives you as his very own. And so on the count of three, I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, if you say, Dean, I need a new start with God, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to say, I want it. And we're going to cheer and celebrate for you. Someone will come and pray with you right where you stand. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Raise those hands really, really high. Anybody in this place? There's one over there. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Someone go and minister to them. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I hope the word of God is changing your life and you're being blessed and ministered to by participating in our services and enjoying the sermons that you see here online. If by chance that you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you take a moment right now and repeat this prayer with me and take that leap of faith and put your trust in God. Pray with me now. Dear loving God, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross and paid the penalty for my sins. And I invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for saving me and loving me in Jesus' name. And just like that, you're adopted into the family of God. If you live in Colorado Springs or are going to be in the area, we invite you to join us at one of our two campuses. Our Woodman campus is at 4005 
Lee Vance Drive that is at the Woodman and Rangewood intersection. And our South Campus is located at 262 South Academy. Join us at either one of those locations. Check the website for service times. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.